In the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus will not allow Satan or the demons to prevail. Over the last three weeks, this message has been made clear to us in the Gospel readings. On Invocavit Sunday, we heard about Jesus defeating Satan's temptations. Reminiscere, we heard that Jesus cast out a demon from the daughter of a Canaanite woman. And now, on Oculi, he casts out a demon from a man that was mute. Though Jesus is certainly weakened by the flesh, he is still more powerful than all of them. He has come to establish a kingdom that shall have no end, and the gates of hell shall not overcome it. The mute man speaks, and people wonder. But some out of anger or envy or something else say of Jesus, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of flies, Satan. This is devilish deceit. It is born from unbelief and runs in the same vein as those who seek a sign from Jesus to prove that he is, in fact, from heaven, that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one. Is it insufficient to cast out a demon from a mute man, giving him back his hearing and speech? Is it not enough that he's gone around healing and even raising the dead? If they won't be convinced by these, will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead? Probably not. For they do not hear Moses and the prophets, nor do they hear the living voice of God in the flesh. In the end, all of these, all of these individuals are of a different kingdom, the kingdom of the devil. And they have aligned themselves against God and against his anointed. You see, there is no Switzerland. There's no neutral party here. Jesus says, whoever is not with me is against me. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, goes forth into battle, just as he did against Satan using words. For his kingdom is not an earthly kingdom of swords, nor bombs, nor guns. Jesus notes, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided falls. Consequently, he's saying, if I were really in league with Satan, I wouldn't be casting out demons. Come on, guys. Instead, I would be doing more work to possess more people. This work, casting out demons, is in fact against Satan and his purpose. He desires to collect more spoils from the kingdom of God. And he's strengthened by his armor of lies. Jesus then goes on to note, if I cast out demons by Satan, then who do your sons cast out demons by? And what he's really saying there is, if you accuse me of this, then you have to accuse your children of the same thing. And then by them, you shall be judged. You see, there can't be a paradox here. You can't be in league with Satan and with God at the same time. Unlike earthly kingdoms where you can have people who act as double agents or traitors, not so in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. 
So Jesus casts out demons, but by what power? By the word of God made flesh, which here he notes is the very finger of God. That phrase used three times in the Old Testament twice indicates that the finger of God engraved the words of the commandments on some tablets. But then also, it's used by the magicians surrounding Pharaoh to note that these plagues coming upon Pharaoh and Egypt are in fact judgment from the finger of God, his power. Consequently, since This is happening by the work of God, by the finger of God. The very kingdom of God has come into their very presence. And this is blessed news indeed. For Christ Jesus, the valiant one, has come to do battle with the strong man. He has come to bind Satan so that he has no more power over humanity. And yet, looking at the cross, it does not seem to be that way. For there is Jesus' chief work of deliverance. And there, Jesus, who's supposed to be the stronger man, is bound to a cross by nails. There, it appears that he has been triumphed over by lies of his accusers and by Satan himself. And yet there is the greatest of battles. For God made weak by flesh reveals the truth for us. He, the righteous son of God, is innocent. His resurrection on the third day proves that. The verdict stands. The son of God is innocent and further. He is victorious, victorious over death and the grave, victorious over Satan, victorious over the law. You see, there Jesus is attacking and binding Satan. He overthrows him. He takes away his armor of lies and brings forth the truth. He takes possession of you, Satan's spoils. And he doesn't stop there. He cleanses you. He purifies you as he is pure. He puts you in order. It's no wonder that next week when we have a baptism, we hear these words before the baptism begins. Depart, unclean spirit. There you see there's transfer going on from the kingdom of the devil to the kingdom of God. As room is given for the Holy Spirit to put things in order, to cleanse, to purify. So that you in holy baptism were once then filled with the Holy Spirit. And throughout your life, this has continued. As God speaks forth his word of truth, which carries the spirit with it. You see, that once you were part of a kingdom of darkness, now you are part of a kingdom of light. And you keep hearing Jesus' voice. I am with you always to the end of the age. I am yours. You are mine, my beloved one. I have mercy upon you. Jesus then gives a warning to those hearing him, but also to us. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest and finding none. It says, I'll return to the house from which I came. When it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order, then goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. If you are filled with nothing, then the demons come back to possess. 
If you deny Christ and his work and deafen yourselves to his word, it gives room for the devil to take you back. But you continue to hear his word, which then creates a rather difficult paradox for us. Because in fact, when Jesus is talking about a kingdom divided, is he not talking about you and me? For the very flesh that we live in continues to be the source of struggle day after day. As we hear in our epistle, we're supposed to imitate God, and yet we continuously imitate man. We're given over to sexual immorality and impurity and most often covetousness, which is idolatry. But, blessed news indeed, the finger of God is still busy and active, casting out Satan and also subduing the flesh. For today, once again, the finger of God has pulled forth confession from your mouths. I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess that I have been covetous. I have fallen into filthiness and filthiness, foolish talk, crude joking and all sorts of other impurity. And there, that finger of God, that Christ Jesus, pulling forth that confession from your mouth is drowning the old Adam as well as all evil desires. And he's raising up a new man within you. For though we are divided, though we cannot stand, Christ comes. So our eyes are fixed upon him again this day. For he promises to us, I will help you. I will rescue you. I am gracious to you. I forgive you. I am your refuge. I deliver you. I guard you. I will not let you be put to shame. I seek you when you wander. I bring you back when you've gone astray. I embrace you with my love. I am your unchangeable truth. Before me, this day, your enemies, sin and the devil, turn back. They stumble. They perish. But you, today, stand and live. The peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord.